The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 4061 in the name of Maurice Corrie on combat stress finds veterans in Scotland face higher levels of deprivation than those in the rest of the UK. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now and I call Maurice Corrie to open the debate. Mr Corrie, please. Seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Three minutes, Mr Corrie. Please could I ask the public to leave quietly so that we can hear Ms Maurice Corrie in a very important debate. Thank you. Mr Corrie. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank members who supported my motion allowing this debate to take place today. Um, I would also like to welcome today the staff members who've come from Combat Stress to join us in the public gallery, and I welcome them here uh, and all the work they do throughout the years to help our veterans and our armed forces personnel. Many of my colleagues will know that I'm a veteran myself, so the subject of veterans' mental health is one which I feel very strongly about. I have campaigned enthusiastically to ensure that the veterans' issues are not overlooked for many years, first as a councillor in Argyll and Butte Council and now as an MSP for West Scotland. I believe passionately uh, that the veterans could get should get recognition that they deserve for serving our country, which is why combat stress findings uh, that veterans in Scotland face the greatest risk of deprivation in both levels of income and employment uh, and is a great concern for me and something which needs to be addressed. I visited recently Combat Stress Hollybush House Centre in Ayrshire and was impressed with the service that they are offering and very much re uh, recognise uh, this service uh, as being absolutely vital to our, to our forces and our veterans and also is now fully recognised by the National Health Service. Combat Stress was started in 1919 and has built up an excellent service to our veterans and also to our serving armed forces personnel. It, I think it is important to firstly note that the fact that there, we are even able to have an open debate today about the impact of mental health issues amongst veterans is a huge step forward. Uh, it has previously been an issue that many service personnel were reluctant to accept. However, by talking about it and trying to help those who do unfortunately suffer from poor mental health, we are helping to get rid of the stigma which still surrounds mental health, and this is a huge achievement. I do believe it is also worth mentioning the great strides forward which the MOD are taking in helping to fight issues surrounding mental health within the ranks of the armed forces. Combat Stress's multiple deprivation is in Help Seeking UK Veterans Report, which I have a copy here, gives us an overview on the experiences of deprivation in a national, in a national sample of veterans with mental health difficulties. It helps to give us a better idea of how best to target specialised military support to veterans with mental health difficulties themselves. It is a survey of over 3,000 veterans registered with Combat Stress, which is the leading UK mental health charity. It has discovered that the veterans living in Scotland have higher levels of deprivation in income and employment than veterans living in the rest of the UK. And in particular, I think the, fi the finding that half of Scottish veterans registered with combat stress live in the most deprived three areas of Scotland is really quite shocking and something which needs to be addressed. These veterans are already dealing with a range of complex mental issues, whether they suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and anxiety, or, or <coughs> so that it's a struggle enough for that, for them to adjust back into the civilian world. Then you add to the fact that they are having to cope with higher levels of deprivation in income and employment and they are living in the most deprived areas of Scotland and you begin to see why it is so vital we need to do something to help. Given that many veterans who do not suffer from mental health issues struggle to deal with the transition from military to civilian life, we cannot begin to imagine how hard it is for this particular group of ex-servicemen and women. It is up to the Scottish Government to work with agencies and charities to minimise the challenges faced by veterans and mental health issues. The report highlights the inequalities that face veterans in Scotland and in terms of employment so that why I and I am sure everyone in this chamber welcome Eric Fraser's work as the Scottish Veterans Commissioner and his 19 recommendations. I was glad to see that the new strategic working group on employment has convened and that they held their first meeting last month and I look forward to hearing the outcome of that meeting and future meetings. I think that this is a very positive step in the right direction to ensure that veterans who settle in Scotland are not left disadvantaged from their military service but playing a full and productive role. 
A further area raised in the Combat Stresses report was that it takes the average, uh, the average, sorry, takes the average um, veteran 11 years to seek help after leaving the military. This brings, back, brings me back to my previous point that by even discussing this issue today in Parliament, we are making headway on the issue of mental health amongst veterans. It could be that a veteran does not recognize or want to admit that they are suffering from mental health issues, so it does, it does, so it does not seek help for many years. Or could it be that mental health symptoms do not, do not set, in, un, set in until other events trigger them at a later date? Either way, our debate today and the work carried out by Combat Stress to produce this report sends a clear message to veterans who think they could be suffering from poor mental health and that it is okay to admit that they need help and that there is help out there for them. The report sets out that those who waited the longest to seek help were the ones who could be found living in the most deprived areas. This demonstrates that it is crucial for the Scottish Government to support mental health organisations and encourage veterans to use the resources that are available to them and get help early. It is also important to note that of those who experienced multiple deprivation, there was a high proportion of early service leavers. This is a group who need to be continually supported as they have also the highest unemployment rates to ensure that they can get the best out of, the, of them as a last, uh, as, as a transition into the civilian world. Yes, I'll give it. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Morris Scott has mentioned a number of times the responsibilities of the Scottish Government. Does he recognise any impact on deprivation for veterans uh, from the welfare changes which have taken place in the UK Government in relation to housing benefit, disability benefits, war pensions indeed? Does he recognise any impact from those changes uh, impacting on veterans in Scotland? Mr Corrie. I think, yes, I t thank you for your, for your, for your intervention, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I understand where you're coming from, but I think as we go forward, there are many charities and there are many organisations, and certainly local authorities, from my experience, who are willingly able to help these people to deliver help and the support that they need. And in particular, under the mental health issues, combat stress obviously is supplying that help so admirably. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, I repeat my thanks to those who have helped to ensure that they were able to hold this important debate here in the Chamber today. I also thank Combat Stress for their research and for bringing us this report, and most importantly, for their support for the many veterans who deal with mental health conditions on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Corrie. I call Marie Todd, be followed by Edward Mountain. Ms Todd, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you, Maurice Corrie, for bringing forward this important debate. One of the first chats myself and Mr Corrie had after we were elected was about veterans' mental health, and we quickly realised we had a common interest. So not only is this issue vitally important, it brings politicians together, even those from such diverse backgrounds and political views as myself and Maurice Corrie. As many of you know, I worked in mental health for 20 years and I now co-convene the cross-party group on mental health. One of the first meetings we held was on veterans' mental health and it was great to hear from Combat Stress at that meeting about the valuable work that they do to support veterans. Now, while I welcome the report for highlighting the really important issue of multiple deprivation, I find that I can't fully support the motion. The report analysed a sample of only 332 veterans who were seeking help from combat stress in Scotland. This is out of a total veteran population of over 400,000. So the point here is that any findings can only be generalisable to the group seeking support from combat stress and are not necessarily representative of the Scottish veteran community as a whole. The report clearly states on page 81 each country reported the relative measure of deprivation independently. Thus, the measure cannot be used as a relative measure between the four countries, and that conclusions cannot be drawn about the causality of associations. Veterans in Scotland were overrepresented in this study, with English veterans underrepresented, compared to the general population and makeup of the UK as a whole. So we need to be very cautious about drawing comparisons with other parts of the UK based on the findings of this report. The Scottish group were different in other ways too. These factors might have had more of an impact on the levels of deprivation they suffer than the geography alone. They were more likely to have served in the army than in the other forces. They were more likely to be single males. 
They were more likely to be an early service leaser, lever, as Maurice Corrie mentioned, and they had taken longer to seek, seek help. I want to pick up particularly on the issue of being an early service lever. The research which Dr Beverly Bergman presented at the cross-party group showed that the high risk of mental illness amongst er the earliest leavers may reflect their pre-service vulnerabilities, which weren't detected at the point of recruitment. And those become apparent during early training and lead to early discharge. Now, of course, poverty in childhood is a risk factor for later mental illness. Campaigns such as Force Watch and Scottish Quakers earlier last year petitioned Holyrood to stop the high number of recruitment drives by the armed forces in schools in deprived areas. Their argument is that many veterans would have gone into the forces young and from the most deprived areas originally, contributing to their lagging position when they leave the services. Now we all agree that veterans deserve the best possible support and care that society can offer across Scotland and the UK as a whole. The Scottish Government has a strong track record with supporting veterans and I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will list the many initiatives in his summing up. The UK Government, on the other hand, has presided over a rise in insecure employment, welfare cuts and ideologically driven austerity. This has contributed to a rise in homelessness and food bank use across the UK. Children and families, pensioners and veterans have all been pushed into poverty and crisis because of UK government policies. Let's not forget that. Uh, thank you. I call Edwin Mountain to be followed by Joanne Lamont, please. Presiding officer, I would uh, like to thank you and also Maurice Corrie for allowing me to speak in this debate. It's actually a very important debate. And I'm proud to declare at the outset, like Maurice Corrie, that I've been a soldier. And furthermore, my son is a current soldier. I would also like to point out, in light of the last comment, that a lot of things have happened differently in the last 12 or so years in relation to uh, serving soldiers, in that they have been more on the front line than we ever have before. Although soldiers in the armed forces have, since the Second World War, served in over 100 different con conflicts, they have never done so for such prolonged periods, or in many cases, for a amount of tours that have been done. Now, I'm sure that we all recognize that stress disorders affect service personnel in different ways. Some know they've got a problem and some don't. Some can cope and some cannot. Some know where to turn and some have no idea. Nothing is indeed simple. And I found the report provided by the charity Combat Stress an interesting and provocative paper, and I'd like to publicly thank them for it. As an ex-soldier, it did surprise me, sorry, it did not surprise me that the majority of service personnel who suffered combat stress were from the army. It's easy to see that the horrors of getting up close and personal will be more traumatic, and, but nonetheless not as vital as, uh, sorry, I'm going to start that again. It is easy to see the horrors of getting up close and personal will be traumatic and that the vital and somewhat indirect support that both the RAF and the Navy give don't take them that close to the front line. Let me be clear, I do not demean the vital roles that they play, but the way they serve is different. Now, turning to the report and some of the information that was provided was surprising, but also very helpful. But it does give us some highly important flags which we need to use in relation to our veterans. It's immensely sad to me that it took on average over 11 years for people who suffer from combat stress to seek help. I'm not sure the report identifies why this is, but we need to find out why and try and encourage veterans to come forward much earlier. I found it interesting that those sought help were just as likely to be married as signal, single. However, it seems that soldiers who were single when they were exposed to combat were more likely to be affected. To me, it's clear that sharing the pain of one's experiences makes them easier to bear. I'd like to see further work to identify if those who were married or were in a relationship presented earlier than those that were not. I also found it disappointing that some still find it difficult to identify combat stress-related disorders and that those early leavers are more likely to suffer. This shows the need for further education while serving and longer-term support when leaving, especially if you leave before your time 
is up. Indeed, the support that the services give to serving soldiers over the long period that they serve perhaps bears this out. All of these points, however, give us a strong guide what we must do. It appears to me that for every five years we should monitor those who have identified from the FAGs as being most likely to suffer from combat stress um, and ensure that they are offered the appropriate treatment. It is also clear that we need to offer a national treatment plan to deal with the issues and that came across loud and clear in the report. Now I'd like to turn to an issue that was highlighted in the report and that is the fact that veterans living in Scotland in urban areas and the, who are unemployed appear to be the greatest risk of deprivations. This in turn means they're more likely to suffer from mental health difficulties. We must make sure our veterans who are most vulnerable don't fall between the cracks. It, I therefore believe an enhanced support package should be considered by the Scottish Government and local government under the Armed Forces uh, Charter. In conclusion, I'd like to commend this excellent report. We have much to do to support our vet veterans. We need to tackle the problems faced by those in urban areas in Scotland, which seem to make them more vulnerable to stress-related problems. We have been given some key pointers. We need to watch those people who are vulnerable. And I call on the Scottish Government, and I also call on the UK Government to deliver to those that have served us, often in the most difficult of circumstances. Thank you, Mr. Mountain. I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate Maurice Corrie in bringing forward this debate on an issue that I think is of central importance um, to the work that we should be doing both here and, and across the country. I have for a very short time had the privilege of being a government minister and in that time the greatest privilege of all was to be the veterans minister and I was struck then by the power of the voices of those who spoke up for those who suffered um, in combat who had their rights generally ignored and they were a group and a force to be reckoned with and it's because of their courage in campaigning for the rights of veterans, the people across the parties said that this was something that across party that we could agree on, that it was the job of government, wherever you were in government, to recognise the particular experience of veterans and our particular obligations to those who had sought to defend our country or who had sought to su support peacekeeping across the world. So while we may want to look at this debate about which government may be responsible for particular difficulties. I know that at heart we all want to rise to the challenge that has been put before us by veterans, by combat stress and others, to say that we have a particular responsibility to understand their needs and provide services in a way that best suits them. We also recognise, obviously, particularly important, the question of mental health issues. In a world where we are becoming more progressive, we need to understand the particular impact of those who have been in combat and recognise that while general provision may be suitable, it is right to understand the need for particular provision supported by those um, who understand more than I could ever do what the consequence of what they have experienced has been. And so we do need both general understanding but specific provision. It's also true in relation to whether it's housing or employment or other services. The question should be asked by those delivering the services, is there a particular impact on veterans and is there a particular need that is being experienced that we need to taper and develop our services for them, particularly for those who do not want even to seek help. And I know there has been progress in, in this regard. And I also say to, to both, um, to all of us, I think, we need to reflect on the evidence in this report and elsewhere and rise to its challenge. There is an understandable desire, perhaps, to look at where actually the report is not reflecting properly the range of differences across the whole of the United Kingdom. But to me, the biggest message this report presents is that there are people who are suffering in our country as veterans, and wherever we have our levers of power, we need to use those powers to support and address these concerns. Maybe I say this because I'm very far away from power, but the job of government is to look at the evidence, listen to the voices, and address those concerns where you have the ability to do so. And in this, I finish on this point. David, Dr. David Webster produced a report this week on the issue of sanctions. People like nurses, social workers, social care workers 
will tell us what is happening in the real world with the provision of services and the impact of de um, disability sanctions. What that tells me when we talk about the veterans who are suffering in a whole range of different ways as others are, don't silo your policy on disability or in budget decisions around local government away from the impact of the people who will suffer as a consequence. We will be strengthened in our resolve to support veterans if we look to the evidence and then develop the policy and fund it that will actually make a difference to the people that we are talking about here, but more generally. Can I congratulate Combat Stress and all those veterans who have given voice to the needs and experience of those who have served this country. Our job now is to make sure that wherever we have influence, we actually develop policy that meets the, meets the needs that they have identified. Uh, thank you, Ms Lermont. I call Richard Lockhead, followed by Peter Chapman. Mr Lockhead. Uh, thank you, and I add my congratulations to Maurice Corey for securing this debate. Uh, which does highlight a number of very important issues, and notwithstanding Marie Todd's very valid points, I think the actual themes highlighted by the report and in this debate are extremely important, and we should continue to debate them in the times ahead. I also want to recognise that veterans' issues have received such a much higher profile in recent years, especially since devolution in terms of Scottish issues, uh, in this Parliament, and the current government, of course, brought forward the First Minister for Veterans Issues, the Veterans Fund, and appointed the country's first Veterans Commissioner. And that together is giving a much greater focus to many of the very serious and difficult issues facing the veteran community um, in Scotland. And I speak as MSP for Murray, which I do believe must have, if not the highest, one of the highest concentrations of veterans uh, living in one particular part uh, of Scotland. I know many of them personally myself. Uh, who are friends uh, and, and neighbours, and I know many of the issues they have to cope with in everyday life in the years since they've left the, the various services. I'm also aware of the very valuable contribution made by Combat Stress and many other organisations who are now out there doing their best to offer with practical support, advice, uh, and so on. And I congratulate Combat Stress on, on this report. Uh, yes, there are parts that do require much further research, and I do hope the Minister will respond to that when he's closing uh, the debate. But we have to be concerned by any report that says that of a survey of 3,000 uh, veterans that those living in Scotland are more susceptible under this report to living in areas of multiple deprivation and all the issues that brings. Now, there are a couple of issues we want to quickly highlight in the report. Firstly, there is the fact that, uh, as Maurice Corrie and others have indicated, it, the report does say that a fifth of veterans accessing care at combat stress are early service leavers and early service leavers are at most risk of mental illness and three times more likely to commit suicide. So that is quite an alarming conclusion in the report, which we have to take seriously and delve further into. Also highlights the need to make sure support is available at appropriate times for early leavers from the services. And again, the report says there is still a significant overall delay between leaving the armed forces and seeking help, as it says on page 11 of the report. So that makes it extremely important that the services are available and that veterans leaving the services know the services are available. And I like the idea of the one-stop shops that are being created. I know there's many organisations doing good work across the country, but the Veterans First Point that's been set up, and there's now eight centres across Scotland, offering a one-stop shop is a very important way forward. Just to be parochial and talk about the issues in Murray for a second, there is a Veterans First Point in Inverness and there's one in Aberdeen Service in Grampian. But despite the fact that the organisation says that the main focus for veteran interface actually occurs in Elgin, in Murray, uh, we don't have a veteran's first point uh, in Murray, which, as I said before, has a particularly high concentration of, of veterans living in the local community. So perhaps that's something the organisation no doubt are looking at at the moment and will continue to look at at the moment. But they do have a drop-in location at the Elgin Resource Centre, and indeed the MOD have just seconded a nurse to work there alongside the NHS and other organisations. So I do think it's important to make sure the support's available, but the veterans know where to access the support, otherwise there's no point having it available if they don't know where to go. So hopefully they can build on their good work moving forward. I also think the Cabinet Secretary should, reflecting on his own intervention earlier on, 
look further into the impact of the UK government's welfare reforms and other policies on exacerbating poverty full stop in Scotland, which, according to this report, will have a disproportionate impact on veterans. We have to understand what that impact will be. So I hope the Cabinet Secretary will perhaps commission some more work into some of the themes emerging from this report, uh, as well as the impact of uh, his own policies, and particularly in this case, the UK government's welfare reform policies as well. Uh, thank you. I call Peter Chapman, the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Chapman, please. Uh, thank you, De Deputy Presiding Officer. And firstly, let me thank my colleague, Morris Corey, for bringing this important debate to Parliament today. It is indeed worrying to think that so many of our service personnel who have served their country and put their life, uh, life on the line to keep us safe find life so difficult on coming out of the forces. The report conducted by Veterans mental health charity Combat Stress presented some particularly distressing information. And one of the most concerning was the fact that it took on average 11 years for the people in need of support to ask for that help. And I wonder why so long. Another notable statistic was the fact that nearly one in five were early service leavers. These people obviously need closer ob observation and more support in the early years of coming out of the forces. The report, conducted, the report was based on a sample of over 3,000 veterans, all of whom were active client, clients with Combat Stress. And Combat Stress is the largest provider of community and residential evidence-based mental health interventions in the UK after the NHS. And it is also the leading specialist clinical service provider for veterans, with some, some services actually commissioned by the NHS. Now, the majority of the sample of the report were male, that's hardly surprising, with an average age of 48. And of the sample, 48% were in a relationship and 52% single. Now, the majority of the folk in the survey had served in the army, 87% um, from the army, only 7% in the navy and 6% in the air force. But this split is not surprising as army personnel are much more likely to be in the front line and in close contact with the horrors of war. What was a surprise to me was the very low number, only 4%, who were in receipt of a pension. And perhaps the most significant finding was that veterans living in Scotland appeared to be at the greatest risk of deprivation compared to those anywhere else in the UK, with Combat Stress Chief Executive Sue Freeth stating that the findings highlight the significant challenges that Scottish veterans face. These challenges are in contrast with those living in Northern Ireland, where on average there is less risk of deprivation. And I wonder what they are doing different in Northern Ireland. Further, 63% of those who left their service early in Scotland were in the most, three most deprived areas. But of those who left after 15 years or more, only 32% fell into the most deprived categories, a trend that is not echoed across the rest of the UK. Presiding officer, this is a distressing report in many ways, and I hope it is the beginning of a more caring and supportive regime for members of the armed forces as they leave and return to civilian life. Given that we now we now know many of these vulnerable ex-servicemen and women spiral into homelessness, debt and mental stress in the first few years as civilians. We must put in place mechanisms of support and monitoring over a period of time to help them to adjust to life away from the forces. It is surely the least that we can do for them as they were prepared to commit the ultimate sacrifice for us to maintain our freedoms and our safety. I therefore call on the Scottish Government to work with the UK Government to devise a strategy to, of support to address the obvious difficulties that arise upon leaving the forces. A civilised society, presiding officer, can do nothing less. Thank you very much. I call on Keith Brown to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and uh, I would also congratulate Maurice Corrie on bringing this debate to the Chamber and also acknowledge uh, and commend both uh, Maurice Corrie and Edward Mountain for their lengthy service in the armed forces. Uh, this Scottish Government has worked tirelessly in support of uh, our armed forces and veterans community, uh, something I think that's been acknowledged across this Chamber many times uh, in the past. We 
have a commitment to ensuring that the armed forces, veterans and their families receive the best possible levels of support. And we set this out in the Renewing Our Commitments uh, document in 2016. And much progress has been made from uh, support on housing to ensuring that from 1st of April this year, veterans who receive social care in Scotland will receive the full value of their war pensions. And that's thanks to £5 million uh, of funding. Uh, in relation to combat stress, we're lucky here in Scotland to have so many excellent charities and organisations who provide a range of support to veterans and their families. And combat stress are one who play, as we've heard, a major role in supporting those veterans suffering from mental ill health. They offer a full range of specialist mental health assessment, treatment, education, advice and support to help recovery and improve quality of life for veterans across Scotland. The Scottish Government has funded them by, uh, to, to the tune of around £1.24 million per year and also £200,000 in the last year for community outreach work as well. Uh, so that's uh, three years of funding uh, up to 2018 will comprise £3.6 million in partnership with NHS Scotland uh, for veterans resident in Scotland at their Hollybush House facility in Air, which has been mentioned. It's also worth remembering that those using that service make up a small percentage of those who have served in the UK Armed Forces. It's also true to say that we have made available £1.1 million uh, through the Scottish Veterans Fund since its creation in 2008, supporting 144 projects. We have appointed, as Richard Lockhead mentioned, the first Scottish Veterans Commissioner in 2014, established a network of armed forces and veterans champions in our local authorities and other public bodies, and also published in 2016 the Renewing Our Commitments document I mentioned, uh, and our desire for Scotland to be the destination of choice for those leaving the armed forces, wherever they come from, across the UK. Now, we have made, I think, great strides in promoting that message, although there's still there's no question about a small but very important number of veterans who struggle to make the transition to civilian life, uh, although overall our veterans and their families are uh, unquestionably true assets to their communities, to their employers uh, and to this country. Uh, the report, though, from Combat Stress was based on responses from just over 300 Scottish veterans and it explores only the experiences of veterans who are already engaging with that organisation. And as has been pointed out, there are a huge number of veterans uh, in Scotland uh, or those who make Scotland their home. Uh, further, the report's clear that each country, and it's important to bear this in mind, each country, this is what the report says, reported a relative measure of deprivation independently. Therefore, no direct comparison could be made between the different countries. Although the simple point is those that require to have uh, assistance in this regard, in relation to deprivation in particular, uh, have to be treated on their own merits, regardless of how things are elsewhere. And I, for my part, certainly accept that more can be done and that there are, there's no question, veterans struggling to make ends meet, just like other members of society, as Joanne Lamont mentioned as well. Uh, and I met some of those people, some of those veterans, uh, earlier on this week at the Coming Home Centre for Veterans in Govan, and Maurice Corey uh, also attended uh, that event as well. But the message I hear is that decisions taken by the UK government that are driving people into hardship, poverty and deprivation are preeminent. Around a billion pound has been cut from welfare spend in Scotland by 2020, 2021, with a 0.2 billion pound cut due to changes coming into force this year alone. Now we will continue to strive to protect the most vulnerable and those on low incomes by mitigating the worst impacts of those cuts. For example, in relation to the bedroom tax, we've made sure that nobody's had to pay uh, the bedroom tax. We're already taking action on reducing poverty. Our Fairer Scotland Action Plan sets out 50, con 50 concrete aims that will help to uh, veterans and others over the course of this parliament in trying to tackle inequality. We've invested over £350 million to mitigate UK wel uh, government welfare reform and to support low-income families and established a £1 million uh, fair food fund as well. I do reckon that, recognise the point that was made about the length of time that it takes veterans uh, to come forward. Uh, I think it's a very important point. Now, I've made suggestions, I think now two years ago, to the MOD that they could help with this simply by making sure that the records for somebody leaving the armed forces uh, have to go to a designated uh, GP when they leave the armed forces. And that way, the falling between the cracks that happens when somebody leaves the armed forces, uh, and then sometimes, as we all know, don't take up uh, either um, some of the other assistance that's available because they don't want to do that, and that's their right, or they don't seek uh, health support because they haven't had to do that in a civilian setting, perhaps for a number of years. If you send that stuff, if you send the medical records to a GP designated by the service lever, 
they then know who they're dealing with. They know the background of the person they're dealing with. They know the experience they've had in the armed forces. And of course, they will make sure there's at least a very first check with that veteran. That seems to me like a straightforward and sensible way to try and deal with it. It won't be the only way to deal with it. There'll be other things which have to be done as well, but a straightforward and sensible way to deal with this. And it is true, and I have seen this over the years that I have been the veterans minister. The MOD started off and senior um, people in the armed forces started off with the view that those that had been recruited from areas of deprivation, uh, that's the the, essentially it was that's the condition we got them in, and if that's the condition in which they leave us, then that's their lookout. Now that has changed over recent years. I've seen a much more enlightened approach, where it's quite simply the case, if it is the case that the armed forces in Scotland and elsewhere have recruited disproportionately from areas of deprivation, there's an ongoing responsibility, not just of the armed forces, but of the state itself to look after those people, not least because of the point that's been made because of the service that they've given. So I think there are things that we can do. I'm more than happy to look at commissioning uh, the work that was suggested by Richard Lockhead. I don't think there's any reason why the uh, cross-party group, it's up for them to decide what they want to do, uh, would not also want to look at some of these uh, impact of uh, welfare uh, changes in terms of the deprivation which veterans suffer here in Scotland. That's entirely up to them. We will look further uh, into this. But I would hope, uh, Presiding Officer, that my response has uh, helped reassure the Chamber of the Scottish Government's wholehearted and ongoing support for armed for, uh, forces and veterans community. Uh, and as, as has been said, I think, by Peter Chapman, that we should be doing that, not least because they've been prepared to make the ulti ultimate sacrifice in defence of the freedom, in defence of the freedoms that we all enjoy. And if, if we um, have uh, any conscience, we should recognise that service, recognise that sacrifice, and make sure that we do everything that we can to help those veterans who, when they do come out of the armed forces, and it's important to recognise this point, it's said to me all the time by veterans' organisations, the vast majority of people come out of the armed forces and manage to go into civilian life with virtually no um, issues there are others who do not and those who do not deserve our full support and for that reason I think it's uh, appropriate once again to uh, commend Maurice Corrie in bringing this uh, debate to the chamber. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament till 2.30.